Right, second attempt. I am Jim T. Martins, and my talk is about digital pitfalls in local politics. And in the background, you can see the screenshot of the start page of the system I'm going to talk about. But before we get to that, some info on the political background. What is the issue with local politics in Hamburg? What do you hear? What kind of news do you hear from local politics these days? Uh, there is the tragic incidents when a local politician, Walter Lübke, was murdered in the city of Kassel in the state of Hesse. Hesse. But <clears throat> generally, finances are tight, swimming pools and libraries are closing, there is an infrastructure apocalypse, and shortly, local politics are mostly neg making negative headlines in Germany. Positive issues are rarely noticed. It doesn't mean that there is no positive news to report, but mostly they are not related to the commune as such. Now, on to Hamburg. And the, the question would be, the city has a long name, which is called the Free and Hanseatic City of Hamburg. Many of you will know the Hanseatic League, the old trade link. But Hamburg was a free city in, in the Holy Roman Empire after the Napoleon Wars ended. <clears throat> when the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved, Hamburg kept far-reaching privileges, and it called itself a free city. It was it, it was free of any subordinate uh, ruling, as it had been in the Holy Roman Empire. That's what it was called an empire city at the time. And Hamburg has remained a federal state has remained the double role of being a city and a federal state, just like the city of Bremen and Berlin. Hamburg, outside its town walls, uh, which are still marked by the Planten und Blumen Park and the um, Wall Tunnel, that was the actual city proper. And everything outside that area, the districts of St. Pauli and St. Georg and so on, were actually outside the city boundary, and um, Hamburg had so-called rural fiefdoms or rural rulerships, which included quite far away places such as Cuxhaven and Geesthacht, which are far away from, from the actual city or federal state these days. And the Hamburg senators were acting rulers for these areas, and uh, most of these were then raised into suburbs and directly placed under city ruling, such as St. Georg, where the whole of the Senate was uh, under control, was taking control. And the Greater Hamburg Act in 1937 um, made some of these areas part of the state of Saxony, or Lower Saxony these days, and others were then incorporated into the city, city itself. And with this Greater Hamburg Act, the city of Lübeck, which also had uh, its own independence, became part of, of, of Prussia. And in uh, one year later, in 1938, Ham Hamburg became a, a Einheitsgemeinde, a unitary commune. What does that mean? For one thing, Hamburg is a federal state in, in Germany. And the term federal state doesn't really appear in the, in the constitution, in, in the basic law, but it is used a lot. But Hamburg is a commune as well, which is the smallest legal entity in German, in the structure of, of German law. And uh, there is a rule that says that the competencies of the commune cannot be taken away by the federal state level. But with Hamburg, uh, there is a the, the situation is special, and also many cities in in Germany have districts as well, are part of a rural district, and Hamburg does not have that either. 
So the Federal State of Hamburg incorporates the city of Hamburg, which has no district, uh, so which, which acts as district as well. So that level of politics is involved, and, the t and then the city itself. Now the Hamburg Senate, uh, the Hamburg Parliament, is the legislative legislative of the federal state, but also the, the uh, city council of the Hamburg Commune. Um, in other federal states, states, this is part of the executive, um, which shows that there is a double role for, for the Hamburg Parliament. But Hamburg is further divided. Below the com area of the commune, there are districts, which are Altona, Eimsbüttel, Hamburg Nor North, Wandsbek, Bergedorf, Harburg, and Hamburg Central. And each of these districts has a district administration with a district assembly or parliament, <clears throat> which is an, a committee of the administrative level, so it's part of the executive, although it is being elected in, in, in Hamburg elections. And the speciality in Hamburg, which always comes up in news, is the so-called evocation, which means that the Senate, the Hamburg executive, can instruct uh, can can issue instructions and and take on executive roles even if a, a specific administration or a district uh, assembly would actually be responsible now let's come to the elections let's elect these assemblies um the election period is five years and uh, it's uh, rules on building plans, it, it, it distributes certain uh, funds and, and, and can, uh, can ask questions to the administration. And we cannot uh, make any binding rulings um, on the actions of the administrative at the high level. And that leads to certain issues, especially in the area of transport. There is a so-called lower transport authority, which is actually linked to police commissions. And this is not subordinate to the district level. It is actually subordinate to the interior administration of Hamburg as a whole. So the districts have no legal um, lever to make any changes or uh, rule about lowering speed limits, for example. If this authority says no, then there is no, no way of moving forward there. Now, on to the digital uh, aspect of this talk. We use a system called ARIS, uh, which was developed by a company called CCEGov. Um, and this tool, through this tool, the so-called printed matters are made available. What are these printed matters? It's everything that is a question, uh, a query, um, an application. Everything that is somewhat relevant, a piece of writing, uh, is part of that system and has a unique number which, with which it's identified. It's grouped into election periods, uh, the numbering system. I think we are currently in the 21st legislative, legislative period. So that's the first part of the number, then followed by a, an increasing number. This tool also distributes the, the funds for meetings. And uh, now, let's move on to the state website in full color. This doesn't look that modern, to put it mildly. It hasn't been, it's not being worked on. I've, um, I didn't, <laughs> this is not a full H HD screenshot, just a section, but it looks a bit last century. Now, on to what some of the activities that you have to perform regularly, which is to download a piece of writing, a printed matter, and that should be the basic thing to do, right? That is the elementary activity. That's what file servers were made for, and, and then you download things from that. Now, I'll take you through a step-by-step -step instruction, and you can 
count the number of steps or clicks it takes. The first step is to log into the system. And as you can see, this cannot be found on the start page of Alrestat, but on the service portal of the city of Hamburg. That in itself is, uh, is, is has been developed anew. It's 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 kind of mobile friendly, and I have I'm I'm logged in in the screenshot already. But that is the login screen. <clears throat> and if you have not, if you are not logged in, and go to this page and try to log in, you will then go to a uh, get to a error page. But if you can log in successfully you will directly be taken to this page. This is an online service in the service portal of Hamburg to which I have access and then I have four things to click on. That is similar to other service portals. If I access the same page through another link, I will first have to click on my area and then I get a list of things I have access to. And with this extra access I have as a member of the assembly, I have this one service that I've shown you. I click the red arrow and, and get to this page. So I have to click on start here and then that takes me to the landing page. That is the view I get as a logged in member of an authenticated member. Looks a bit different. You have a log out button. Uh, you can see which uh, meetings you're invited to. You can see something about uh, session funds. And you can actually hand in applications online. But that is normally uh, happening through the parliamentary parties and their offices. Now, if you click on invite to a disclaimer, this is not a current screenshot, this is from the autumn last year, but it's still factually correct because at the moment there are no sessions, so there are none that I can be invited to, which we will soon see in the calendar. But if there was an invitation here, I would see the date of that session, the time, and there would be a link to it and the place where, it, where the meeting room is. The meeting calendar is clearly dated. This is from April. Um, I will show you what's happening in April. Now, we are in on the second weekend. It's the 12th of April today. And apart from this main committee meeting and a, another meeting on the 30th, there is nothing happening this month because of Corona. But that shows you quite nicely what the normal load of session is. I don't have to be at every committee meeting. I'm not a member of all the committees. I'm in the regional committee and two subject committees, but together with the district assembly, that is four uh, uh, appointments a day, and then there is two meetings of the parliamentary party, so six states where I have to, just to be present, and then there's time for writing um, um, petitions and, and things like that. Uh, and, and the look is very 80s, I think, with uh, this, this folder look there. If I move on and click on one of the meetings, you have the agenda for that meeting with a nice clip graphic included there. Um, I would arrive on such a page if I had an item in the invitations list and clicked on that. That will take me to the agenda for that meeting. There is the public and the non-public part of, of the meeting. And on the right, do you have the written materials? Um, uh, there is a link and a button, uh, which I think are do the, doing the same thing. But the interesting thing is on the upper right, where you see the agenda and the invitation uh, in writing. So, and 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 the materials. So exactly what I want to download. So that was a super complicated way of, of navigating to those. But it's it gets funnier and or worse, however you want to see it. Now consider for a short time, take a break for a few seconds. How this should be implemented in HTML. What is behind this look? Because the question, of course, is could I, uh, which I can do at the uh, Hamburg Parliament, 
if, if I were not using the login portal, if I was a public visitor and, and, and wanted to see what the agenda was for a meeting, could I share a deep link for people to get to the agenda directly, for, for them not to click through directly, a, 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 a stable, fixed URL? I was asking myself if I can do that. So I'll give, give you some 10 seconds. Right. So let's look at how it's implemented in HTML. Wonderful table design. And if you think back when divs were introduced in HTML, that was, and that, that when you think that HTML5 is now the current version, so tables really are an anti pattern that is still being used productively. And all these three links are, can be found in one table row, which is one. Uh, and and the table cell is all the way through this uh, through this uh, source view, and that contains another table with uh, a one pixel image in one of the cells. And it seems that the rows are from the left to the right, rather from from the top to the bottom, and you can see forms in table cells. Right, each of these links what, what looks like links is actually a form so there's a form for accessing the agenda i've marked the relevant fields here and, and the action and there is a hidden input there dolph dnr there are options a hidden input value 64 and there's a button which i click on so these are actually buttons in HTML. And then I considered, how can I get a stable link from that? What is Dolph DNR, for example? That is the, just if you consider, that could be the, if, if you expand this with knowledge of German, that could be the running number of the document. Action is do027.asp. I don't know what that is for, but this is the action. So if you put these together in, in, to get parameters, you have the number and the options equal 64. And this is probably PDF. I don't know. I've, I've tried to change that and would then not get a PDF, PDF page. And it is possible to turn this into get parameters rather than post parameters. So I can put this into the address line, add it to the action, and then get to the same page. So that gives you, in a new tab, uh, a temporary view with the PDF viewer, and I can download it from there. Now, could this be a persistent link, uh, kind of <laughs> through certain details, but did this now get me to a link I can share? No. Well, it's a clear yes and no. It's persistent in the sense that the link will always lead to the correct document. But for some reason, for some, which is completely unclear to me, you have to access the start page before accessing that link. Even if you use the public uh, site, which requires no logon, you have to access the start page first, and then you can go directly to that URL in the same tab without manually navigating there, then it works. Otherwise, it does not. So some kind of session idea clearly is set without which the whole thing does not work. So apparently, the design target was to make it as difficult as possible to share documents. So then I thought, challenge accepted. Can I somehow manage to not have to click so much and save valuable time? Now, consider what you have to do. We have a login. I have to click on start here and then on being invited, go to the meeting, download all the three documents. It's quite monot monotonous, right? So I thought, okay, what tool can I use to automatize this? Something like Selenium, perhaps, which is normally used for browser testing, but maybe for a scraper as well. Could be used for that. 
Of course, for the login, I need authentication data, which I don't want to save in the source code, which would be bad, particularly in an open source software that I would like to publish. You shouldn't put any authentication data in there, so it needs a config file which is not committed, but which at runtime should be known to the software. I may turn this into a Python packet using Firefox and Gecko driver and Selenium, and it's available on PyPy.org here. I'm not just saying that it is accessible, you can download it and, and, and install it in Python. But it's not a perfect solution. It's not mobile friendly, for one thing, because neither Android or iOS can run Python. So I need a mobile first index page with links to the loaded do downloaded documents, which I built using Bootstrap 4, put it in Uberspace and run as a cron job. and hid behind an HD access file because the documents that I can download as a member contain non-public sections, so I need uh, to protect the access to that. I cannot make it public to the world, and this is all stored in the index.html. And there are some problems with Selenium uh, because at Uberspace, where headless mode is used, I can run it, but the cron job, running at as a cron job, uh, will lead to errors, not at the moment, because there are no sessions at the moment, but there are errors, and I haven't been able to resolve these errors yet, and or to see what's behind those errors. So, enough theory, let's go to some, some practice and show you the source code. The whole thing starts with imports, uh, that's relatively standard, two fixed links that I've stored, which I use as forward links. Um, the district of Eimsbüttel leads me to the public start page for the district, and the f first one up here leads me to this login page of the service portal, which the with the correct forward link, so that I will we be taken back to the right page and not ha need an extra click. Standard config options, default config options which I used. If no config file is found, uh, it's then created with the standard option, otherwise it's read in. And here Firefox is started, the login page is, is opened and the login performed, then the page with the start here button is loaded, and then a page I haven't explained with the SI012.asp page has to be opened. This represents the invited to meetings page. So that is the server address for that, for whatever reasons. And from that page, I get all the meetings that are in the table and download all the documents and close the browser. Login is simple. You find the elements in, in this page and uh, click the button. Get meetings is a table that uh, has different colors implemented through classes ZL12 and ZL11. I go through the individual elements, the individual entries for the session, sessions, the meetings. Every session is a row in this table, which has various tables, uh, table cells in itself. For, from the first column, I get the day. From the second, I get the time. And the fifth column has the link to the agenda and, and a link object, which gets me to the actual agenda. And the name of the session is the link text of that same link. The location is uh, the next column, so I, I add all these into parameters and uh, Python 3.7 and the data class makes it very simple to uh, write all these getters and setters. It's uh, very simple to, to write. Then downloading documents uh, uses this D007 page, which I've mentioned. I'm opening this agenda link, the uh, overview for the agenda. <coughs> I am <clears throat> I then search these links through XPath expressions, get the links for the agenda, the uh, uh, materials for the for, 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 for the session, for the meeting, and then I open these temporary PDF pages and download the PDFs from there, and I do that for all the meetings I've found, and. Finally, I put all, the, and here you have functions that, that assemble those links, uh, getting the day, passing the day, an abbreviated name for the actual committee, 
I produce in a separate method uh, or function, and uh, I then uh, kind of replace certain abbreviations with their official ones. And uh, so th that much about the source code, I'm now going to run this to show you. You'll see a Firefox window popping up, which is then driven by Selenium, entering all these data. I click Start, I click on Invitations. Uh, there is nothing to see there because there are no current meetings that I'm invited to. But this, of course, was way faster than me clicking through this manually, so that's valuable time. If this has all been executed. Once this has all been executed, an index HTML is generated, which looks like this. The last committee that I was invited to was on the 18th of March, the last meeting. That was the GNUV WDI. This was the Green Sustainability, Environmental Consumer Protection, Economy and Digitalization uh, meeting. If you have any, if you think that computer scientists love abbreviations, politicians love them way, way more. And if you click on these, you have the invitation, the materials, the agenda. You could implement something there too. And this file, of course, is not publicly accessible because it contains non-public parts for obvious reasons that cannot be made accessible. But the whole thing still works if um, I make this, if I make this smaller, this is still mobile friendly, whereas an direct, a directory index generated by a standard web server without bootstrap or any other op op options would still show you the desktop page, which would give you very small, three very, very small links, not as nice. Right, going back to the presentation. So what is what could be a solution? Because this is a, a, a real workaround. It works if you're logged. If you can log in, it can only work under certain conditions. It's not perfect. So what would be a more fundamental solution for the whole problem? And that led me to Opal. Um, and by their own statement, this is a standard API for accessing public. Uh, uh, town council information to make these available in an open data sense for as many uh, purposes as possible. I, it looks nice. I contact this, these people. The latest information on the website is kind of old, and they assured me that they are still active. But it's quite at a quite good state. They don't have to make as many changes these days. The next question, of course, is how widespread is the standard? Is it something that could be implemented? Is, is uh, And because if not, uh, you could stop. But all relevant products for town council information systems have, have actually implemented support for OPAL. And ARIS, our software in version 4, does support it and uses it. It's part of the product description. There is one paragraph that says that, it, that OPAL is supported. So I thought, OK, this is great, right? Well, not really. <clears throat> I didn't fear factoring the administration here. There are some certain hurdles. First, a lack of understanding of open data. I talked about the digital strategy in Hamburg. I've referred to that. I've looked at that. It's, that's not too bad. But if you look at the glossary there in that digital strategy and, and search open data, this is defined as data without license which I kind of digested for a while because li no license normally means that all rights are reserved, which is the exact opposite of open data, to make data public. Because copyright protections uh, apply by default, I have to <laughs> have to give away these rights to make to make it public. So I have to explicitly put it under a different license to make it usable as open source and open data. Okay, maybe um, they thought um, of Microsoft uh, and, and said we don't want a license pop up and want to avoid all this. 
But that clearly shows a lack of understanding. Now, the use of such a, a interface doesn't seem to be very clear to the administration. Introducing it, of course, costs money, you need a more modern UI, which would be necessary anyway, but of course a certain investment is involved. So without getting an, a tangible use, because a better UI doesn't is probably isn't regarded as a an actual uh, benefit, uh, you have of course also to educate people in the use of the new interface. So that all costs money, and the administration doesn't seem to be u needing it. Uh, and so the, the purpose of the standard is not to improve the administrative working with with the data, but other entities, whether it is companies or private people, have them use that better and, and make it machine, uh, make it uh, processable through by machines. And if the administration doesn't see a sense of it for, for themselves, they don't seem to see uh, a need for it. So I was thinking of uh, planning for public tendering, which uh, is happening in transport policy. The town, um, when they change timetables, they get on the offensive, they, they try to improve public offerings and improve uh, frequencies, uh, even if the usage numbers in tra public transport uh, doesn't seem to call for that. And that is, of course, a chicken and egg problem. If services are not there, the need is not there, and people will not use public transport. So they understood they have to invest and create an offering to create the demand and, uh, and make it possible that demand grows. But in IT, the thinking seems to be the opposite. Um, if they, they they seem to tell themselves no one is using it, so why should we introduce it? So another chicken and egg thing. If no city implements this, of course it cannot be used, which should be clear, but not it seems to the administration. So the the, the tip of the the iceberg or the you know the, the 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 crown of the whole thing. When I was talking to the administration about this, I got the information that they regard OPAL as a proprietary standard, and which made me think, proprietary standard, has the administration any clue? Have they looked on the website a single time? Have they wondered what proprietary actually means? Obviously not, because OPAL is neither proprietary nor is it a standard that is used by a few makers. It was developed with a few makers, yes, in order to be used by the public. Standards without use are worthless. They're not worth the paper they're printed on. So they were working together with certain makers to, to see that the standards are implemented. So this situation means that I couldn't get any further. So what can be done? First, you should apply for jobs open jobs in the administration. If IT jobs are advertised, apply. Or jobs that are touch on IT. Because if you don't get competent people into the administration, things cannot improve. The competency doesn't fall down from the heavens. It has to be inserted and introduced into an organization. <clears throat> the second path is finding a legal foundation and, and instruct civil servants to do something, because then they will do something. And tell it to them that there has to be a machine-readable access to these data, because the and uh, there, because there is a transparency portal which contains PDF, which they regard as the creme de la creme, uh, that of course is the most minimal thing that you can do. It's not it's not the creme de la creme. It's not the best you could think of, because there's a lot of meta information missing. The information which committees this this uh, resolution has gone through, which uh, the results, the, the the voting results were, all that's missing. If I just have a, a closed PDF which is also not that well machine-readable, uh, rather than a plain text file enriched with meta-information. So, to get to a positive example, the, look at the city of Munich. They have a crappy uh, town council information system, but the data uh, is being offered through an interface, which I think is called Munich Transparent, which has a much better optics, and and I think opal.org links to it as a positive example too. And also, put pressure on politics. I have the interior perspective, 
as a member of the assembly. But if you look at where people with IT competence are placed on, on voting lists, uh, whom you can elect, this again is shocking. And if there is no competency in parliaments, things cannot change. There are competent people in the Green Party and other parties. But the one thing is what the party committees have. Uh, you have people there that, for example, are in the members of the CCC uh, who can then insert their competency. But if these people are not in the decisive positions in the parties, someone as a member of the Hamburg parliament who really with uh, passion st uh, stands up for IT and not as something that is part of their portfolio, then you won't make much progress. So that, hopefully with a positive outlook, is what I can offer you as something that can be done. And uh, if you have, if you're looking for contact info, here's my website, which also contains my public GPG key. I have a Twitter account, I have a GitHub account, Twitch, just look for two Martins and you will find me. And the last few minutes, I look forward to your questions. Right. Thanks for this interesting talk, dear two Martins. And uh, we'll go through the questions now. There was one question about Opal, which was already answered. And the next would be, how can you avoid having a stack of complicated scripts at the end and, uh, and as a workaround for the underlying scripts? So, as a techni technical info, I cannot hear the questions. Uh, that's why I'm uh, answering only with a delay. I've heard the question uh, over the screen. I'm not sure what to say about that, uh, about this stack of scripts. So there's obviously some communication going on between uh, the organizers and uh, the stream has a lot of delay. That's, uh, of course, annoying to have such a delay. Next question, is this actually compliant if you, as a an employer, hang on, is it compliant if you, as an assembly member, store non-public documents on systems by other providers disregarding the protection by an EHT access file? What are your rules on documents security and taking documents home or storing it on your own servers as 
parliament or assembly members? Uh, yeah, a good question. Really, we have we have all our private devices where we store uh, these documents, and uh, these private devices are more or less secured, I guess. Um, we we have uh, uh, deputy email addresses, um, but uh, many have their own email device uh, and uh, use uh, some free webmail system uh, to exchange these documents. So uh, IT security is is not very well set up, and so. So, uh, that the document is behind an HD access uh, protection, it's not ideal, but uh, looking at the risks, it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, particularly worse than uh, having uh, these documents sent in the clear over uh, public email servers. So, I, I, I think my solution there is even more secure than, than what people normally do. Yeah, unencrypted emails even. An interesting question, how can you make IT jobs in administrative authorities more attractive? Uh, so one thing definitely is uh, payment. Uh, the Hamburg IT uh, subsidiary data port uh, actually uh, isn't paying that badly. Um, so uh, they they uh, supply IT services to uh, c countries here in the region, and uh, they don't pay that uh, that badly. So it's uh, it's it's like it always is. Uh, if if the current system is not so great, uh, the pain to improve it. Um, uh, is is a disincentive uh, compared to a job where I can set something up uh, from from the beginning, and so so people starting those jobs might might be actually in out of their own conviction, and it's. Uh, it, it's a bit like uh, 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 postponing uh, doing your homework. So, um, in the end, you have to do it. Uh, that that would be my approach. Uh, better pay and uh, help with uh, frustration tolerance. Thank you. Our time slot is nearing its end, and uh, it seems that there are many questions in the pad. I assume that you could uh, perhaps respond to some of the other through social media or direct contacts. That Those are the methods that, with this online conference, we have to fall back to. But thanks a lot for your talk. Yeah, pleasure.